Hey there, traders. This is Sam. We're back for another E-mini futures market recap for Wednesday, October 30, 2024. The time is currently 8.03, almost 8.04 a.m. Eastern. We're looking at levels in the SPY that will serve as our basis for entering trades in the E-minis or the ES futures today. So far in the overnight session, prices stayed mostly flat from where they closed yesterday. But one difference is that this morning at 8.15 and 8.30 a.m., there are employment numbers and GDP numbers coming out, so it would not be too surprising to see price get rearranged a bit before the open. Otherwise, not much to say about the other levels on the board today. It's always a good idea to know what's going on in the bigger picture and be aware of price action on other time frame charts and what other indicators are saying before trading at any of these levels. As you know, whatever happens during the open session, we'll talk about after the closing bell. If there were any e-mini trades that resulted from the spiders hitting these levels for today, we will dig into all that then. Catch you on the other side. We're back. It's right after 8 p.m. I'm going to attempt to talk through the trades quickly and make more time to discuss that rate of return metric that I showed for the first time in the previous recap video. And also we can get into the forecast of what price might be doing in the near future. So you can see the two levels that the SPY hit today. How would you have traded them? Well, this first attempt here at 581.72 from the underside few minutes after the open, it didn't amount to anything, uh, but it's just good to be aware of what price did here at this point in time. The operating level would have been 581.67, bring it down to five cents toward price. So we can adjust that now, and I'll go ahead and adjust the other level down below at 579.90. Just pay attention how close they got right after the opening bell. So no trades until price came into 579.90. If you were following the rules, you'd give the market 15 minutes to settle in and not enter any trades until after the 9.45 a.m. candle close, at least in the Eastern time zone. So that close was right under this level. 9.45 was here. You can see the close, 579.79, right under. They did a couple things within a minute or so, though, that made a short trade here less than desirable. They had already hit this level from the underside right before the window was open to get into that trade at the actual level. However, price got within two pennies of triggering a trade here a minute after. You see it's 579.88 before pulling back very quickly, just enough, almost exactly what you would have needed to score a four-point base hit. So that's a near miss. Plus, the way price behaved as they fell down into this level is usually indicative of a fake out before the bulls take control and drive price back up. It doesn't always happen this way, but I've seen it enough to know what to look for. So getting into a short position here was off the table per the rules. You had to be quick, but within that one minute or so, they gave you the clue that a short trade probably was not going to work. So does that mean you jump on the long side of this level? Well, if you have other reasons to see that whole area as support, then sure. When we look at the trade that I took here, you'll see that I actually anticipated a bounce here even before that 15-minute window was open. I bought two contracts uh, ahead of this as they were coming down into it. It paid off. But we're talking about treating this as a process, so no, you would have not entered a trade here, strictly speaking. When price got back up to 581.67, was that the time to go short? Normally, yes, it would be, but I believe you had at least two reasons to perhaps not take a short trade here. The first reason is this attempt back here, where they tipped to the level and pulled back very quickly right after the opening bell. And another reason is what I said before about market behavior that looks like this, where kind of fake out in the opposite direction of where they really want to go and really want to put price. So after seeing this kind of bounce off this level here, you would need to see more reasons why this gap, which is what this level was, just the close of yesterday, could offer decent overhead resistance. Gaps can be good places to enter trades, but you need more reasons. This morning, I just wasn't seeing any other reasons, so I did not go short here, as you'll see in the live recording of my trade. So far, no official trades in the bag if you're playing by the rules, but the one trade that you should have taken per the rules was the recycle trade when they came back down into it here. So now it's 581.76. Not a near miss here. Still valid when they came into this level. So the market already told you this whole thing was a fake out. Now they're above this level and they push price back up. So when they come back down into this level like this, it's usually a reset for them to try again for higher prices. That's exactly what they did. So taking a recycle trade here on the long side was your ticket. So one official base hit for the day. Look at my trade now. I'll start playing this. You can see the time. It's right after 9.30. So when they came down into this level at 579.90, as adjusted, you'll see me put a limit order on the chart to buy two contracts 
before they even got there. So it was, you know, two, maybe three minutes before the 945 window was open. There we go. So I'm long two. At first, I thought I'd just take the whole thing off at a you know, five-point base hit or something. But I took one off at what you just saw right there. And then I have a target here because I don't really know at this point if I want to go short here or not, but I definitely want to get out. Either they come back and stop me out or I get out of the trade there. I did get out. And you'll see me just kind of ignore this. I'm hovering right below it. 581.27, that would be a four-point base hit in the E-minis. They never did it. So I just kind of looked at it for a while. And then just backed off. And honestly, pretty quickly after this, I made the decision to not really make any more trades. I had eleven fifty, eleven hundred dollars in my pocket at this point, and I had things to do, so I kept an eye on things. I made all the levels dotted, as you know, that's kind of my protocol to not make any more trades. I mean, at this point, I'm expecting them to go up here. I have a short trade keyed in the system. I had an order to keyed in the system to go short at five eighty three sixty five. You know what I'm talking about? But that never happened. They never hit that level. And I thought about taking this for a recycle here. They didn't get to it. I canceled it at this point. I just made the decision not to make any more trades. So you'll see they did hit that. I wasn't in that trade. So I missed that one. And then all the levels go dotted and I'm done just watching this until about noon, at which point I closed up shop and that, were, that was it for me for the rest of the day. On the daily chart, we've shown this trend line before. And so it's kind of hard to see on this daily chart. But if we zoom into an hourly chart, they actually got below it. So that might mean something. As I've said before, I mean, they've had, we've had a couple triangle patterns here. There's kind of a sloppy range back and forth. They're pretty much right in the middle of that. But if we get into an hourly chart, you can see they closed one hour below it. The last hour of the day, does that mean anything? Don't know. I'm going to kind of keep an eye on things. If we start at the daily chart, we go down into some smaller time frames. I'll just kind of skip ahead maybe to, say, a two-hour and let's just start paying attention to where price is as it relates to the moving averages on these specific charts. And volume doesn't always reset very well, but you kind of keep an eye down at the bottom here. Mostly under average. Uh, hourly chart, we looked at that already. Under everything but the 200. Half hour, under everything. Which stands the reason that smaller time frames are going to be the same way. So kind of weak toward the end of the day. Maybe even go down to a 10 minute or a 5 minute just for kicks and giggles. Hard to see, hard to tell exactly on this daily chart. We had a huge spike in volume, some type of signal. Yeah, maybe that's something, but they're just kind of at a precipice and slightly below. But we could wake up tomorrow morning with something else going on. There are other data releases happening the rest of the week, tomorrow and Friday. And then, of course, the FOMC. A lot of things happening in the near future, which could kind of affect the flavor of, of the market. The tracking logs, you can read the notes here. This is the play in by the rules log. This is the one base hit. You can see the first one here at level three wasn't triggered. Near miss, we talked about that. We talked about all this. So there's your one base hit, four points. And you can see how everything looks. And then on my log here, Sam's trades, uh, I got that base hit on the long side. And it ended up being 11 and a half points with a two contract trade. There's my 1150. So let's talk about the total re uh, rate of return here. Now, Maybe the simple thing to do is go back to the play in by the rules log. Really, both of these logs are the same until we get to March of 2024. And that's when I started keeping track of you know, my creative trades. So how does this work? Well, this is an additive function in here. So no matter what I'm looking at, if I just go to, say, one month of 2022, the very first month of this, where this uh, log starts, you can see that it's 9.3% rate of return for that one month. I just want to kind of illustrate how this works. So this is based on an assumption that you have a $50,000 starting balance and you're trading two contracts at each level. So everything you see here in this this log, every level is treated the same way, as you know, in this PBR, this playing by the rules. So let me just go ahead and show you how this works. So if you have $50,000, and I'm just going to do this longhand so you can see it. And then, so these are $50,000. At the end of month one, trading two contracts at each level, you had an additional forty-six fifty. Then you should know what that is, but I'm just going to do it here, forty-six fifty. There's your total after the end of first first month, right? So the formula to determine rate of return is, and I'm just going to do this the long way again, is your ending balance, which is fifty-four six fifty, minus your original balance, fifty thousand. Divide that by the original balance, 50,000. Multiply the entire thing by 100, and you'd have your 9.3%. And of course, the same thing 
if I just take the entire year, let's just go filter all this back out. We'll jump all the way to the bottom. So for the entire first year, trading two contracts, start out with 50. This is not what you end up with. You have an additional 71,875 on top of the 50. So to make this easier, I'll just say equals 50,000 plus this number. There you go. So to see where the 143.75, just to back check that, we're going to take the, the new amount, which we know is here, subtract it from the original amount, 50,000, uh, divide that by the original amount, multiply the entire thing by 100. There's your 143.75% rate of return for the year. Now, since I've shown that, then you can see how if we just look at the year, I also point out that, you know, say you had $25,000 and you're trading one contract. I'm sure you could, with the current margin requirements, you could trade one contract with less than that, $15,000 or so. I just don't advise that because oftentimes with the strategy, you're, you're scaling in. You know, you, you don't have enough margin to buy more than one contract if all you're trading with is $15,000. But anyway, just to point out what this looks like for the years, this is uh, playing by the rules. Every single level in here, treated the same way. For 2022, 143%, 23 was 177%, and to date, we're at 156%. Rate of return, because we're only through October at this point. And now I'll go to Sam's trades. It's going to be the same with 2022 and 2023, but in 24, actually, let's just kind of keep this open here. So here's 24, 156%, Sam's trades, 2024 is 233%. Hence the uh, thumbnail. I think I used that for yesterday's video because that's what I'm talking about. So since March of this year, these are all my trades and you've seen the vast majority of these trades. So you know where these numbers come from. And not all of these months, individual months have been profitable. The only one month that was in the negative, I think was November of 2022. So you can see of the 10 trades that were taken or the 10 days that were traded, I should say, it was a 60% profit, 40% loss for that month ended in the red. And November of the next year, 100%, not, not a single day ended in the red. There were some drawdowns, if you will, with some of these fumbles, but you can see how, that, how they played out. And then on my trades, I think maybe July was a pretty good year or month. July was a pretty good month for my trades. So I want to kind of just look at these numbers, kind of pay attention to how this works. The profit and loss is basically days ending in the green, days ending in the red. And then if we want to look at playing by the rules, October of 2024, you can see 85% profit, 14%. I don't have to read this out. You can read it out. You can read it yourself. Total rate of return, 25.9%. Playing by the rules. Mine is slightly better, but I take less trades typically. So it was 18 days that I traded versus 21 days if you were treating every single level the same way. Anyway, I hope you found this useful. So going forward, this total rate of return will be on every single one of these tracking logs. Something I probably should have had on a long time ago, but honestly, this kind of came uh, to light when I was talking to a, a coworker and he was telling me about the uh, World Cup championships, the futures and Forex trading, and some of the percent rate of returns that these guys have gotten over the years. I mean, I could beat a lot of those, but what was it, Larry Williams, what was his name? 11,000% turned $10,000 into 1.1 million back in 1987. Trading futures, that's pretty insane. But it's not hard to get triple digit uh, returns, honestly. Just read it like a process. But anyway, I just wanted to show you guys that. But anyway, that is a wrap. So I hope you found all that helpful and learned something. Uh, thanks again for subscribing to the channel, supporting this. And uh, if you want to stay updated, just click that bell. You know how that works. And if you're interested in learning the strategy or at least getting the levels for the time being, then just check out ticksandtrades.com. There is more information on the website. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you tomorrow morning, new levels and a new game plan. So have a great rest of your day.